Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I'm going to get started here. So the, um, the, the title they gave me was Practical Approaches for Balancing Diets for Amino Acids, and then we, we talked some more. So there's some work towards the end where we're integrating energy um, to describe the amino acid requirements of cows. That may not be as practical right now as we'd like, but that's what we're hoping is the future. Uh, in all endeavors, um, I don't have a big thank you slide at the end, but you can see a bunch of co-authors up there, um, and there's more people behind that than, than uh, I have time to talk about right now, but um, it, takes, uh, it takes an army of good people to figure out how to get this done, and my grad students have, uh, and colleagues have uh, supported a tremendous amount of this, so we'll just get going. So today's discussion, what are the opportunities for amino acid balancing? What are we capable of now? Um, I think the key to the whole thing, and, and this is part of the whole modeling process, I've been, I, I was one of the first people to apply the CNCPS to an actual feeding uh, study uh, all the way back in 1990, <laughs> when it was still in a Lotus 123 spreadsheet. Um, and, and over that time, it says something about my age, but over that time, uh, what you find out is that the model is very powerful in many regards, but you've got to use it to figure out what's first limiting because that's really what it's good at. And then once we know that, then we can make our changes and make our adjustments. You know, so a little bit about basic biology around amino acids. I'm actually going to go through that pretty quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit about feed chemistry. I'm going to talk about feed ingredients. Then we'll talk about formulating uh, for metabolizable protein and refining formulation with amino acids. And I'm really going to tie that together with energy, right? So then we'll summarize quickly. I think to me, the, the important thing here, at least the way we approach this whole process, is the cow is the ultimate arbitrator of whatever we do. And uh, as Brian said right up front, he goes, when are you going to get this thing done? <laughs> Uh, not soon enough for me. Um, it's kind of a love-hate relationship, uh, not with Brian, but with the CNCPS. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I think that as we go through our processes here and we work on a model, we're spending a lot of time trying to break it and find out how good it really is. And we're doing a lot of cow studies to ask that question. If the cows agree with us, then hey, we're good. If the cows don't agree with us, then it says we got to go back to the drawing board and figure out why we can't represent what the cow is actually doing with these nutrients. So that's one of the things that's been kind of holding us up uh, is that we want to make sure that it works, right? And like I said, the cow, the cow is our judge, and we want to make sure that we're judged fairly um, and appropriately. And when we know that we're good, and we're getting pretty close. We can we can move forward. Right. So to that, and I, I, um, I just still all this stuff down to its simplest form. Uh, we can get into the biochemistry of nitrogen metabolism and transporters and ubiquity. You know, we we can do aquaporins and how urea moves around. You know, but in the in the end, a cow a cow can be disassembled to a couple of different parts when it comes to nitrogen. The first thing is. She needs nitrogen in the rumen to maintain adequate microbial growth for carbohydrate digestion, right? Not a new idea. By far, you know, a lot of that was characterized over the last 50, 60 years, refined by certain people. We know peptides can be stimulatory. Uh, we know that pretty much all bacteria in the rumen use nitrogen. Protozoa eat bacteria. That's how they get their nitrogen. Protozoa produce ammonia, all right? We always forget that. Uh, so in the end, there's a requirement for ammonia in the rumen, and we got to figure out how to meet that. That that is a separate requirement from the amino acid requirements of the cow. And I think part of our problem here is that we have continued to use this metric of crude protein to describe all of this. And, and again, Brian alluded to, uh, to the next version of the model. We won't have crude protein in the next version of the model. Cows are going to consume nitrogen. So you may have, you may be describing cows that are consuming 600 grams of nitrogen. And uh, we're not going to convert that back to crude protein because it actually confounds a lot of the compartmental modeling that we do to describe uh, nitrogen through the system. Uh, leaving it as nitrogen is much more efficient. You don't have a ratio. 
So once we have rumen requirements met, the cow requires amino acids. And, and now we know that there's, there's a lot of forms of that. Obviously, microbes are the big one. Undegraded feed are the other one. Other aspects of that. But, you know, we've uh, we grossly underestimated the supply of endogenous protein. Uh, proteins that have sloughed off from her room and her esophagus, her tongue, enzymes and things like that secreted along the way. Uh, that can be 20% of her amino acid supply, uh, depending upon what cow you're feeding and what her intake levels are. And we can thank Elaine LaPierre, Daniel Willet, and a few other people who have um, uh, demonstrated and actually given us the data that allows us to model this uh, more effectively now. So there's, like I said, there's more people on the slide that that uh, the title slide that I didn't have on there, but have made major contributions to our ability to do this. And then in the end, anything she doesn't need or is fed in excess is excreted in the urine. And that's where the problem starts, right? If she's if she's peeing it away, uh, it's nitrogen she doesn't need. So we're feeding something that's not being used effectively. Uh, so we could either be overfeeding it, we're feeding it in the wrong form, doesn't have the right amino acid profile, too much room in nitrogen, all sorts of things to think about there. But so we're using um, this concept of uh, urinary nitrogen relative to productive nitrogen to kind of figure out how to pull back on some of that excess nitrogen that, that she's wasting, right? I think one of the big things that we all kind of know, but we don't formulate using this concept all the time is that milk yield and milk protein synthesis is an energy-driven event. There are energy-driven events, right? And, and it's energy, it's the ATP that's going to drive protein synthesis and drive lactose synthesis. Um, it, uh, you know, then you're going to get a bunch of, you're going to get a bunch of downstream indicators after that, right? You're going to drive it through insulin and IGF-1, which we'll talk about in a minute. So once you have met the energy requirement, or you know where it's what the requirement should be then the outcomes re, you know relies on an adequate supply of amino acids and this is all driven by propionate production for the most part you know propionate is converted to glucose which then stimulates insulin right and, and what we know is that for the most part give or take as we produce more propionate about 70 percent of that that glucose produced from propionate is going to be taken up by the mammary gland. That seems to be kind of a fixed number, right? Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about should we have more ruminally available starch or less ruminally available starch? And then you get into the hot theory, and I, I'm not going to go there today. What we do know is that as we push more glucose to the large intestine or the small intestine, um, that also supplies, you know, energy to the cow but there's a discount on that energy for lactose synthesis. The glucose is taken up across the gut and based on the data of Reynolds and several others, Catherine Knowlton, um, uh, and there's other folks out there now that have looked at this. There's at least an 18% discount of that energy due to tissue use prior to getting into circulation in the portal drain viscera. But what we also know is you don't generate the same kind of insulin and IGF responses from that form of absorption. So intestinal glucose is okay, but what we really want to do is make more propionate and we want to be really efficient at it. Um, and that to me is how we're going to get all the downstream signaling that's going to help us produce more milk protein and some more milk, all right? So we know insulin uh, stimulates protein synthesis in the, in the mammary gland. Um, this has been shown for a few years now since some of the uh, euglycemic insulinic plant data that was generated on Dale Bauman's lab and then others. Um, and we know that energy intake stimulates IGF-1 secretion from the liver, right? And obviously it does that in many different ways, lots of binding proteins. That, that's not, you know, the, the control of IGF-1 is not important here. We just know that we get greater, there's greater synthesis and secretion of IGF-1 from the liver as energy intake increases, all right? We also know that protein supply per se is not an activator of milk protein output, although I think there's some data coming that would suggest maybe it is for certain amino acids, but we know 
that there are receptors and promoter regions for IGF-1 that are responsive to things like amino acids. Uh, we know that mTOR um, is one of the gatekeepers of all of this and responds to the presence of certain amino acids in the face of adequate energy or inadequate energy. And you've got things like elongation factors that will stimulate you know, the production of proteins. And then we know that methionine, leucine, and, and others are involved in this process. Um, but protein can be a signaling mechanism. One of the cleanest examples of that is here, and it's as a calf study conducted uh, at Illinois in, in Jim Drakeley's lab. So this is, uh, you've got two levels of in, intake. I'm gonna just look at the, the red line on top. So those calves were fed at 14% of body weight, uh, four different milk replacers that varied uh, from 14 to 26% crude protein, but they were fed isocalorically. Right? And you can see, you know, in that plasma IGF-1, if you gave the calf more energy, you know, from yellow to red, so we went from 10% of body weight a day in intake to 14%, you can see that, that energy does increase the secretion or the, you know, in, endogenous production of IGF-1, probably from the liver. Uh, so circulation, circulating levels go up. But notice what happens when there's enough energy and we add more protein that you can see in that red line, we're increasing the circulation, the concentration and the circulation of IGF-1, all right? So again, the idea that those two things are integrated is really important and it's a nice clean example of that where we can see that energy is stimulating IGF-1 and then as we titrate in more amino acids from a greater supply of protein, that the liver is responding saying, hey, you've got the building blocks to make more protein. You've got plenty of energy. I'm going to give you greater signaling capacity to stimulate that outcome. OK, we know this also happens in a cow. I don't know of a clean data set in a cow where where this kind of a titration has been done, which is why I come back to this really nice uh, calf study. All right. So they are integrated. And I think we have to keep that in mind and we have to build our system to represent that, all right? And we know some of this, you know, if we go back, like I said, to some of the work that was done in Dale Bauman's lab with hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps, you know, Tim Mackle uh, just doing the clamp with no increase in, in amino acid supply or any branch chain amino acids, you know, the mammary gland increased milk protein output by 15%. And then Miko came along and, and he did the same thing and they infused casein in the abomasum and they got a, a really nice response, right? So it said the signaling's there, for, but once you give the signal, you got to provide more protein. And, and then to come back on that, you know, there's a lot of, there's data coming out of France and some other groups right now that would suggest, hey, as we put in more gluconogenic diets, we're going to increase our efficiency of amino acids. And that is what you would believe from the Mackle data. And I, I don't disagree with that. My concern is, is that Tim Mackle only did that for four days. So it makes me wonder how long they're going to have that available protein pool to allow them to do that. We get some indication that the signaling is greater than that. Once we add some protein, we get a better response, which is what you see in Miko's study. And then in the second Mackle study where they added branch chains and casein. And Brian Beckett, um, saw the same kind of response when he did clamps and IV infusion of amino acids, and, and he saw this insulin response uh, in goats, right? And then so you know, milk and protein increase significantly in those animals. So we know that this is intimately involved in this whole process. This, this very nicely says, hey, we gotta, we gotta marry these two approaches and make sure that when we descri describe the amino acid requirements, we're doing it with energy in mind, because that's really what's going to drive this outcome. An example of that um, is a study that we ran uh, years ago in a 3,200 cow dairy. Um, and it just this is a farm study, room protected lysine, um, two, two high pens um, went on a control, two high pens went on the RP lysine. This was back in the days of CPM dairy. I'm not going to get into all the numbers right now, but what we did was a very, very simple study. Just brought this product in, split the pens, 
started feeding it. And you can see here, this is real data. Here's milk production in pounds. And we can see the blue line are the, the cows that received the, the RP lysine, the red line are the, cat, are the cows that were on control. And you can see some differences here over this uh, 80 to 90 day period. And then when you, you know, take it away, you could see them come together, right? So on milk yield, we see a little bit of a response. When you look at uh, milk protein production, same kind of thing, you initiate the treatment, you know, between the two pens and you can see a difference all the way across to the end. You take them off and they come back together, right? So again, we've got a little bit of a milk volume response. We got a little bit of a milk protein response. And then when you look at fat in those same cows, all right, what we see here is we see again, once we start the trial, we see a nice separation of the amount of fat that's being produced. Again, it's not extreme. It looks a little messy. This is this is herd data. These are daily daily calculations. Um, we go for about 90 days and then we stop and you can see them come back together. All right. Well, why do I show you this? What's my purpose here? Well, this to me is informative because, you know, one of the things that I, you know, we always get into this mode of saying, hey, if I'm going to add a rumen protected amino acid, I expect a protein response. OK. And, you know, well, maybe, maybe if that's what her antiparotic need is at the moment, it uh, depends on what, what she's deficient in and what she needs that amino acid for. Uh, Gerald Lobley did a study with Raggio several years ago and they found amino acid carbon um, in, in glucose. They found amino acid carbon in fat. They found amino acid carbon in protein. Uh, so the cow will use it in whatever way makes her more efficient. I look at this amino acid supplementation as the way to just increase the energetic efficiency of the cow. And I look at data like this, because when we look at this outcome, dry matter intake of those cows didn't change. It was about you know, almost 27 kilos a day. Milk volume increased about 1.4 kilos. Milk protein increased about 68 kilos. 60, sorry, 68 grams, Woo uh, milk fat increased about 45 grams on an energy corrected basis. She, she improved her productivity about 1.6 kilos a day because intake didn't change, you know, feed efficiency or energetic efficiency improved by about 3.3%, right? So the way I think about this anymore is that how did I improve my feed efficiency because I removed the most limiting nutrient and in, in the end, I don't believe this is a linear, I'm going to get more milk protein. I believe that she's going to use it to improve her energetic efficiency. And in this case, it was 3.3%. You know, uh, at the time, uh, it was 29 cents a kilo. So it was $7.68 to feed these cows. Amino acid cost was about 29 cents. Increased revenue was 78 cents. Margin was 49 cents, right? There was a nice margin in the end, but you, you had to look at all of the metrics. You couldn't just look at milk protein or milk fat or milk volume by itself, right? So, but that comes back to your milk market too and what are you paid on, okay? So integrating energy. So I, and I think I, I make this recommendation to, to everybody now, uh, formulate an energy corrected milk because that, that will capture your volume, protein or fat yield changes and for the most part, that's usually easier to detect, easier to detect than one particular aspect, right? And I, I've got lots of stories. We don't have time today, but I've got lots of stories about people coming back and saying, Mike, I, I did this and I didn't get a response, right? And I'll ask them, what did you expect? I says, well, I expected more milk protein, more milk protein output or milk protein percent, you know? And if you're in Italy, they're going to say, especially in the Parmigiano region, they're going to say, well, I need more percentage because that's how I get paid. Um, and I've got several cases where they got greater energy corrected milk output, but it didn't do exactly what they wanted to do. So they thought it was a failure, right? So energy corrected milk is really more informative for this type of outcome. And, and we need to think about that. Okay. So formulation considerations for amino acid balancing. Again, some of this is really simple. I'm not trying to insult anybody here. Uh, but these are questions when somebody calls me up and says, hey, I'm not getting this to work right. Can you help me out? 
All right. So I'm, I'm going to go right back to the very beginning and say, OK, where are we at? Do you have current feed chemistry? Or are you just using library values? Right. Because if you tell me you're using library values and I'm saying, OK, we got some work to do here. Did you do NDF digestibility? And somebody's going to, you know, everybody says, what does that have to do with amino acids? Well, to me, it has everything to do with amino acids. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Have you characterized the cows appropriately? Man, this is a tough one because uh, it means we got to spend a little bit of time and it's not that we don't spend time doing this, but it means we have to have fairly intimate knowledge of body condition scores, body weights, days in milk, stage of lactation for all these pens. And it actually sometimes means we need to have cows that have been tested for that particular pen and not just some bulk tank value for MUNs or protein or something like that. Right? That characterization to me is 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 important and, and can be really powerful. You know, how much milk is that pen really making? What's the range in that pen? Um, do we have dry matter intake? And if you have dry matter intake and you've got good feed chemistry and you put it all together, where, where do you line up? Where does the actual milk line up with ME and MP allowable? Right, because then if those two things cannot agree and you're several kilos, pounds off, whatever it happens to be, until you reconcile those two things, you really don't know what's first limiting. And, and then it's really hard to make a good decision. Right, if you don't know what's first limiting, then I don't know what we're going to do first to improve the situation. Right? If you can't make those things align, sometimes that means you need body condition score change. Right, and I, I know that's part of characterizing the cow, but I put that in there because many times I'll get somebody who will say to me, Mike, I, you know, I've got diets formulated, uh, you know, for 43 kilos or 90 pounds, and the cows are making, you know, 37 or 38, and I can't figure out where that extra milk is at, you know, and they're down in the low 80s. And come to find out, you know, that for some reason they're not persistent. Right. This is what we did. So it says there is something wrong. And then we go do some body condition scores and we find out that those cows are creating body condition score at a rate that accounts for that extra energy or body weight. We don't get body weights very often, but if you get body weights, you can do the same thing. So the point is, is that we're there. A lot of times they're still very efficient, you know, but we go chasing this milk, not really knowing how the cow is partitioning that energy. And that is really important, especially if we want to refine uh, down to the gram of amino acid level. And finally, what's first limiting? Once you know all that, you should be able to get to some assessment of what's first limiting, and then you can make your adjustments. Things that drive me crazy, and and I in this again, I, I do this simply because I weekly, weekly, I get calls or asked to solve problems. And I, I see this happening, right? Uh, Mike, I can't make things work. Um, nothing, the energies don't line up, all this kind of stuff. Well, you find out that the cows probably weigh somewhere between 750 and 820 kilos, but the input in the model or whatever ration software they're using, doesn't have to be the CNCPS, could be the NRC, could be Spartan, could be any of those, right? I, I get calls about everything. Um, you know, they're, they're 100 kilos or better off on body weight. Well, you, you can't be 100 to 150 kilos off on body weight and expect to reconcile the diet to grams of amino acid efficiently. And I know this is one of the hardest things for us to get, but boy, it's one of the big, biggest drivers of not figuring out how to get really efficient milk out of cows. Not using actual dry matter intake, uh, you know, I still see that not using current feed chemistry or just using crude protein and NDF or not really well characterized NIRs. Um, all that stuff will get you into trouble if you're trying to do refinement, right? And again, the last point there is just what I said on the previous slide, not taking the time to get the cows and the formulation system to agree with each other so you can make an informed decision. That, that's the power of all of this software. Whatever software you're using, that's the power of it. Um, you know, it's to get those two things to reconcile, figure out what's first limiting, 
and then go ahead and make the right decision, uh, an informed decision to improve things. Now, here's an example of, um, I just happen to have this. Here's a CNCPS prediction for 655, body weight at 1588 with a mature size of 1764. And it actually says on an MP basis, and I know this is um, not on amino acid yet, but on an MP basis, we're, we're minus 38 grams on MP balance, which means we would have an opportunity to bring in some amino acids, right? We're deficient on MP. And I didn't change this, sorry, I didn't change this one to kilos, but a lot of times I see people doing this, right? We got cows that are at 1588, but they're modeling something at 1350. There's no deficiency there, right? When in fact there probably is because that's not the cow and that, that looks like a really subtle thing, but I can tell you uh, this is more frequent than than we would like to admit to ourselves sometimes. And uh, we've got to we've got to get better at this, right? Especially if we're going to get to grams of amino acids. All right. And I said this earlier, just to recap re, um, this, we need to we need to separate crude protein from true or metabolizable protein and amino acids because the cow just doesn't understand that. All right. Back to the idea about urinary nitrogen here. Um, old data, I use this slide a lot because it's pretty clean. You know, uh, an Ohio State and a, and a Penn State study, and you can see they went from 430 grams of nitrogen intake to 754. Fecal nitrogen doesn't change. What they don't need, they excrete in the urine, right? And we can see that we're, we're looking at 100, you know, 100 and 40, 150, 160 grams increase in nitrogen excretion here. And the, the, the CNCPS, and I'll come back to that, has the ability to predict this with fairly high accuracy, right? So if you take this kind of data, and, and I, I pulled this together from some of our studies, some stuff from Broderick and a few other labs, I can't remember everybody right now, but you know, these cows are making about 40 kilos of milk, they're eating about 24 and a half kilos of dry matter intake, the crude protein of the diets range from 14 to just about 19 percent. And the blue line there, so on the y-axis you have milk, urine, and fecal nitrogen excretion. On the x-axis is nitrogen intake. The blue line is milk nitrogen, that's milk crude protein, or milk true protein actually, converted to a nitrogen basis and probably does include the MUNs now, I can't remember. Um, but it's going to be milk protein converted to a nitrogen basis to put it on an equivalent comparison. And we can see the red line is the feces and the green line is the urine. And when you look at most cattle there where that red circle's at, you know, they're excreting more urine and fecal nitrogen than they are milk nitrogen. So what we're trying to do is, is with the modeling exercises, get them to get down to a one to one basis. Right, and if you do the calculation on that, you're looking at about 40 grams of nitrogen. And if you take 40 grams of nitrogen and work it up to a, a protein basis and put it on a soybean meal equivalent, you know, you're talking about 1.3 to 1.8 pounds of soybean meal difference there in terms of the nitrogen contribution, at least, right? So, so that means that you know if you're excreting that much urinary nitrogen that you don't need, and you still have a, a rumen that's positive in rumen N, then you could pull out that protein that she's not making good use of and basically wasting because she's peeing it away, and now bring back some carbohydrate, and now you've got the opportunity because you should be closer to your protein requirement to bring in amino acids, right? Because now you've made space, you've you did some cost savings got rid of the stuff that's creating an environmental problem, and then you, you bring that, you bring in some other things to, one, make more bugs and, and get more energy out of the diet, and also now you can supplant that with some protected amino acids. If you're doing really well and you got the right forage makeup, you, you can be in that, instead of one one-to-one -one range on, on urinary to, to milk to urinary or milk to productive end, you could be 1.2 to 1.3 to 1 or better. This takes much better management, takes the right forages, takes high quality forages, uh, and it takes a little bit of time to build a diet like this, right? 
And, and this is uh, doesn't really matter which version of the, the model you look at. They all have these predictions, um, you know. So again, average, a lot of the industries 0.7 to 1. Acceptable, really good, 1.1 or 1 to 1. Outstanding would be 1 to 5 to 1. You can see here in this output from NDS, it's 1.26 to 1. I've seen CPS output here, productive end to urinary end. 1.46 so this is actually a really good herd and they're very efficient with their use you can see productive end a total end at 38 percent right so sometimes we can't change the overall efficiency of the diet and get more and, and stimulate more intake or milk protein output per se but what we can do is get rid of the stuff that she's excreting and not making use of and then bring in the higher quality ingredients again some more carbohydrate make some more protein make some more uh, propionate and and then bring in our amino acids feed chemistry is important you know we talked about this a little bit uh, digestibility is really important here you know if you have a good digestible forage you're a hero i know it's not your you didn't cause it but you got to use it um, but you know when we do our modeling exercises the most important variable in predicting amino acid supply is digestible NDF. And that's described, um, I think we put that into the paper that Ryan Higgs wrote and, and published in 2015. Um, you know, because what happens with high digestible NDF is you get three outcomes that we know are all better, right? You get improved feed intake, we get better room and health, we get more microbial yield. And, and all those things are, are going to yield more energy, more propionate, more amino acids, and, and uh, we're going to get more out of those cows, okay? And I think this is important. I'm not going to go through all of this, but, you know, some of this is coming out now because I think, you know, with the quality of forages, we're having a bad year right now with the spring, at least in the Northeast. I think yeah, the rest of the country looks better, but we've been cloudy and rainy and snowy um up until the last couple of days and we'll get one sunny day and then it's back to four or five days of clouds so our forages you know from last year still aren't good i don't know what this year is going to be 750 kilo cows should be consuming at least 1.2 percent of body weight ndf andfom that's 9,000 grams you know that means that 27 kilos of dry matter intake you know that should be about 33 percent andfom in the diet in the rumen, they're going to keep somewhere between 7,800 and 8,000 grams in the rumen at any one time. And we probably have a maximum, we think we have a maximum amount of UNDF now, and those cows would cap out at about 4,800. And, and now we have, we're working towards the ability to integrate this into our calculations because if UNDF in the forage is high, that becomes first limiting. Otherwise, total ANDFOM will limit fill. And I don't think that the cow has a UNDF requirement. That's a different talk. But we know that rumen function will decrease with inadequate ANDFOM intake and content, and, and we need to pay attention to this, right? And because what happens is when we have higher quality forages, they fill faster and they empty faster. And you can see this, these two lines, you got a diet, the base diet with a lower quality forage and the green line with a higher quality forage. And you can see that it fills and empties faster which means we get greater intake and more, you know, and every time that happens, we get more bugs, more propionate, more everything, okay? Other things that confuse us, what's getting to the small intestine, is it digestible, okay? And, you know, again, back to figuring out what's most limiting. We developed an assay. We've been working on refining that assay. We think we're done now. Um, we should be getting the paper out here soon as we went back to test a bunch of other enzymes to make sure that we didn't miss something. Um, it is being used, although I think we've got to clean up how it's applied in some of the labs. And we use this data in place of acid detergent and soluble nitrogen, right? We ran a study with uh, a high digestible blood meal and a low digestible blood meal. Cows were eating about 670 grams of nitrogen a day. We were formulating, you know, between five and six percent of their intake in terms of the difference in digestibility, which was about 38 grams. Right? Diets were about 15 percent protein, about 32 percent NDF, 30 percent starch. Cows consumed 
the same amount of nitrogen, which is good because now you can test your digestibility differences. If those were not, if those were significantly different, then we wouldn't have a valid test, right? So I show that. What it says is, what we learned is that the cows actually understand this just like a pig, you know, and then the monogastrics live and die on intestinal digestibility. And that's something that just hasn't been part of our uh, process here, our normal feed chemistry. But this clearly says that if you have a high digestibility feed here, like in this blood meal versus a low, the cows immediately know that. We, we kind of assumed this would be true. We were happy that the, uh, that the assay was, will, was capable of predicting this. When we looked at the milk yield, you know, the cows are um, in, sorry, this is in uh, pounds, the uh, about 670 grams of intake, dry matter intake's the same. We get about three pounds of milk volume and about three pounds of energy corrected milk difference. Body weights were not significantly different. They all gained about the same. They gained about the same amount of body condition score. Feed efficiencies weren't different. Milk nitrogen wasn't different. But we took all that data and we put it back into the CNCPS, right? Uh, body condition, average daily gain, chemical composition of feeds, we let the target growth system to deter determine our, our growth requirements. And we used uh, the UN values for those blood meals is the only, and that was the only thing we changed. We put that in in place of the ADIN. And what you see here, you know, you see the energy corrected milk at the top in pounds, 92 and 88. ME allowable, the energy allowable is over 100, right, which is how we formulate it. And some people would say, well, geez, Van Amber, that's a really bad prediction by the model. And I'll say, no, it's actually really good because they're protein limited. You can see that if we use the ADIN and NDIN, we're still predicting close to 100. And if we stick the UN assay data in there, you know, all of a sudden it says we are protein limited. The high digestibility blood made it was 40, 94 pounds of MP allowable milk, 92, 88, and 87. So it comes in line, right? So we were able to do that fairly adequately, but that's probably really an amino acid deficiency, right? Lysine was going to be deficient there. So, so these digestibility factors and things that go unknown will affect our ability to predict limiting amino acids because in this blood meal, we know we were deficient in lysine. Right. So our opportunity here was to recover some of that milk loss in the low digestibility blood meal by adding a room protected lysine source but that would have defeated the purpose of the study. All right. So when we start looking at amino acids, so now I'm going to dive in for the rest of the talk. It's all amino acids. When we get into this, you know, we've got many predictions for what things should be right. And we're I think we're pretty well set. If we look at methionine and lysine specifically here, we can see, you know, rule quin 7, 3, and 2, 5 for methionine, lysine, or lysine, methionine, dopel 7, 2, 2, 5, rule quin 7, 3, basically 2, 5, NRC 7, 2, 4, and 2, 3, 8. We look at the recent version of the model, um, 6, 5, we get to about 2.6 as a function of the MP, methionine is a function of the MP, uh, which is a little bit higher than everybody else, but not far from what Ruleclin had. Practical application is we have started to tie this to grams of methionine per mcal of ME, right? And our original estimations were 1.12 to 1.15. We have data now that says it's at least 1.15 in this current version and should probably be closer to 1.19. When we look at lysine, we can get the same breakpoint analysis, this broken stick model, and we get to 7% uh, of the MP is lysine, right? So not discordant from the rest of the information uh, that you've seen from those previous uh, calculations. Where we've moved to, though, was using data from uh, Dopel and LaPierre um, and looking at efficiencies of use, and when we pulled the data sets together and re-derived all of this, we came up with fairly similar efficiencies. You know, our efficiency is a little bit higher for things like leucine. Um, lysine was fairly close, 0 0.67, 0 0.69. Our efficiency of use for methionine was lower than what uh, Helene had. 
but what we did differently in all of this is we went and that calculated all of this on a gram of digestible amino acid per mcal of me basis and derived these uh, factors here, right? So it would say that in version seven, we want to be feeding 1.14 grams of methionine per mcal of me. We want to be feeding 3.3, 3.03 grams of lysine per mcal of me. If you take those values and you put them on as a percent of essential amino acid, just for reference, 15, 1, and 5.7. And again, if you go back to the Schwab numbers, you're at 14, 9, and 5, 1. So we're very much in the neighborhood. If we go to Roquin's data, 14, 7, and 5.3. So in a 2.7, and our value is 2.7. All right, so we're we're you know we're pretty comfortable with this approach. So we took this data, and we ran a, a study several years ago. Heat stress conditions. It was summertime. The corn silage uh, moved uh, nutrition nutrients on us, but uh, we had a base diet that was limited in methionine, limited MP, but adequate in ruminant or limited ruminant. We added methionine. We were still limited MP and ruminant. We added urea. We were adequate methionine, but and now adequate in rumen N, but limited in MP. And then the positive diet was adequate in everything. I call this third treatment here the Chuck Schwab treatment because he didn't believe the cows could recycle nitrogen. I'm glad we added that because when the corn silage moved uh, much lower on crude protein, uh, we needed that extra nitrogen to keep that rumen and positive nitrogen balance. We did this for 100 days. Uh, measured everything, did fecal collections for NDF digestibility to back calculate our MEs. You know, the bottom line here, in the interest of time, crude protein, 13.5, 13.6, 14.6, 15.6, 6, right? So we are doing what we want to do, and that is push the boundaries of our understanding and find the limits of the cow, but also figure out if we can predict that using our modeling exercises here. Can we get the CNCPS to predict this? If you look at these optimum grams of amino acid per mcal of ME, we'll just look at methionine and lysine here. Methionine, you know, 1.14, 0.93, we're deficient. 1.13, now we're up pretty close to the requirement here based on our numbers, and that's with adding the methionine. We add the urea, and it comes up a little bit more because the rumen was deficient in nitrogen, so we get more efficient microbial growth. And then at the positive, we've just got a good supply of, of escape protein plus microbial yield, so we're over that. And you can see that's true uh, for the most part for all the essential amino acids if you were to look across uh, those numbers, right? So what we find? Dry matter intakes were the same. Energy corrected milk, 38.5, 40, all not different, 41.8, right? So all positive and we see uh, a significant increase in that part of that's amino acid supply, part of that is uh, just room and nitrogen balance. But I think that's interesting, right? Because if you come down here and look at milk volume, 13.5, 13.6, 14.6, 15.6. The cow's making 40, almost 41 kilos of milk on, four, on 13 and a half to 14 and a half crude protein diets. All right. Does say something about amino acid balancing. I think our profiles of amino acids helped us out here. And you can see that on a milk volume basis, right, not significantly different. It's not until we energy correct the milk that we pick up the difference. OK, so this gave us some comfort to say, hey, you know what? The cows are understanding these relationships and these ratios because the cows kind of responded. Now, we had low milk fat. You can see the fats down here because we were really in heat stress conditions in an old barn that doesn't exist anymore, but had really bad ventilation. Protein still doesn't look good, but again, cows were heat stressed. So I think we were suffering a little bit there. Right, and we can look at their intakes of nitrogen, 521, 532, 582, 615. All right, and if you look at MU or PUNs, you know, here's where we got in trouble with those that, that drop in the corn silage crude protein, 5.9 and 5.7 are, 
are low. Anything less than six based on some older data uh, would suggest that the rumen cannot maintain positive nitrogen balance. We're not recycling enough. We can't recycle enough because it's just too low in the system. And in fact, we have that prediction set up in the model. We can predict bacterial growth depression and we predicted about a 16 to 17% depression. And in fact, you could see that in the NDF digestibility, right? So that all kind of came together. Uh, and you can see, you know, when we added the urea, now we're up in a range that we feel comfortable and we got good productivity out of those rumens and cows, right? So, so there is a limit here of how low we can go, but the key to the whole thing is keeping that rumen happy so it can make, uh, keep enough nitrogen there to keep the bugs doing what they're supposed to. We followed this up uh, recently. Uh, Andrew Lapeer is currently doing his PhD in our lab. And, um, you know, we wanted to challenge these numbers, right? Because that, what I just showed you from Ryan Higgs was the first study that I know of where we balanced for all essential amino acids on a gram per mcal of energy basis, right? It wasn't just methionine and lysine. We did it for all the essential amino acids. So we said, can we do it again, right? And those were individually fed cows. Well, now we're going to do something completely different. So here we have a study where we did 16 cows per pen, three pens per treatment. So we're doing this in pens. 25% of each pen was a primiparous cow. Um, enrollment was 60 to 120 days. And then we're blocked by everything that would make them as balanced as possible. Right. And if we come back to how I didn't show this earlier, but this these are the graphs from Ryan's work. And, and these ratios here, I need to change this. Those, not, those aren't really ratios, those are efficiencies of use of amino acid, right? So the y-axis is a really efficiencies of use of amino acid. On the x-axis, you have digestible methionine supplying grams of methionine of amino acid per mcal of ME. And you can see that we, we could solve these curves to find the optimum, right? Which we did for both of them. We did that for all essentials. What's most important here, though, is you can see there's dispersion around our predictions. So in this first study, what we did is we tested, well, what would happen you know, if we fed our optimum, but then we went up one standard deviation for all the essential amino acids? And of course, what would happen if we went down one standard deviation for all the essential amino acids? And, and you can see that the dispersion is greater and lesser if you went through all the essential amino acids you're going to find you know lysine has a pretty big range here methionine not so big a few of the other uh, amino acids again don't have such a wide range so it's not even an, a uniform uh, distribution among all amino acids so that makes it tricky to do this uh, it took uh, andrew a good four months to put these diets together and a little bit of head banging uh, but you know a little bit of scotch and a little bit of uh, thought process and we got through it, but it's, it is hard initially. Here are the diets, heavy corn silage, high moisture urea corn, you know, you can see soy plus in here, you can see some smartamine in there, you can see some blood meal in there, energy booster, dextrose to drive fermentation. Um, you know, here's uh, what the chemical composition looked like, you know, crude protein 14, 14, 7, 16. So again, the negative is down one standard deviation for all essentials. The positive is up one standard deviation for all the essentials, at least as good as we could do it, right? Again, these kinds of studies aren't done. <laughs> this is only the second time that I know anybody's ever done this, right? And you can see, you know, where our UPs are at, not that I like that metric, you see the MEs, we tried to do this under isocaloric conditions so we didn't confound it. Starch is right around 30%. Here's the grams of amino acids. So I'm gonna highlight the lysine and methionine in the interest of time. Methionine, you went down one standard deviation, you got 71 grams of metabolizable lys or methionine a day, 78, 93. You do the lysine, 201, 222, 250. All right, so so big swings and all of those, those were actually easy to match because we can use high quality room protection sources. You know, we, we had, again, we had a little bit of a hiccup here. I don't know about tryptophan, but for whatever reason on our positive diet, we, we just didn't get enough tryptophan in there. 
Everything else tends to go up accordingly. Isoleucine kind of plateaued here a little bit. Um, but again, you know, this isn't this uh, we've never done this before. So learn how to put these together and we don't have a solver to do this for us. So it's all hand iteration. But anyhow, this is where we ended up. You can see the lysomethionine. And, you know, for the most part, dry matter intake. Uh, this is in pounds. Sorry, I didn't get this corrected. This is in pounds. You can see there's a big drop in milk from the neutral to the negative, right? And those are significantly different. When you go to the neutral to the positive, though, there's a trend, but they're not in a P less than 0.05, they're not significantly different. So it says if you were to plot this out, it looks like a plateau effect. You see a little bit of an increase there, but it's not remarkable. There's a bigger drop by going the other way. So it gave us some comfort that we're not too far off when you look at true protein yield. And this to me is really the most important thing. Yep, we went down significantly when we went to the negative. If you look at the neutral 2.78 pounds and you go to the positive 2.84, those are not different. The fats are not different. The lactose is not different, right? Uh, true protein percentages are not different. So, so this was pretty comforting to us. It said, hey, you know what? These optimums may not be that far off. We may have one or two that we've got to work on once we've got this set. But for the most part, we can operate close to those neutral numbers and, and what we call neutral or our, our original optimum numbers and say, OK, we can we can formulate around that and not worry about losing too much milk. And again, we're going to work through these differences here because some of this may be the energetic side of this, which is what we're going to text next. And you now I, I make this point. I got several people that said to me once, Geez, Van Amberg, you know, you can't do, you'll never be able to do this in the field because you individually feed all these cows. Well, we did this study in a pen simply to make the point that, in fact, the average feeder on the average farm could probably pull this off as long as you got, had enough information and knew what you were delivering every day. All right, and we looked at body weight changes. Some people would say, well, geez, maybe they're not going to gain any weight. They're going to be too deficient. In fact, we didn't see any of that. They did gain weight. Right, um, and you can see the MP, if you put it on an MP basis, about 2650, about 2970, and just over 3200 grams. And, and there were some changes in uh, efficiency, right? And you go from the negative at 149 grams per kilogram, 157, 160. So again, kind of a plateau in efficiency of use of the nutrients. And, and uh, that says this, this optimum, the neutral values uh, are, are probably okay, right? But to challenge that one more time, and this is a few more slides here and I'll end. Another study that we conducted uh, last year and finished here just a few weeks ago because we did it in two blocks. Uh, again, 16 cows per pen, 192 cows, same kind of setup, 25 premium pairs, 75 multi pairs. Uh, and here's all the, the information on that particular study on the cows. So here's there's data out of France um, and some data out of Canada and a couple studies here in the US that are looking at the variable efficiency of use of amino acids. And you can tell from our perspective that we picked an optimum and believe that that stays relatively fixed. But, you know, we're, again, like I told you earlier, the cow's the ultimate arbitrator of that. So we're going to test these things under our construct to find out if the cows agree with it or not. Because if the cows don't agree, then we've got to go back and modify the model to capture that information. So in this case, we had a low fermentable starch diet at 100% of our uh, amino acid requirements, not really MP, it's really those amino acid requirements. And then we had a high fermentable starch diet at 100% of those amino acid requirements, in other words, at our optimums. And then what we did, we did uh, a low fermentable starch diet and we didn't go up quite one standard deviation, but we increased all the essential amino acids on a gram per unit of energy by 5%. So now we're, by our optimums, we're overfeeding the amino acids. Um, and then we did the same thing. We went 5% higher on starch and we went 5% higher on the amino acids. OK, 
Okay, so we've got an increase in propionate supply and amino acids, an increase in um, um, propionate supply and amino acids, no and no. So isochloric conditions though, so more acetogenic diets, more pro, uh, gluconogenic diets. Again, heavy corn silage up front, a little less here. You know, we're using steam flake corn in those high uh, fermentable starch diets. Uh, beet pulp is in there, some wheat mids, and you can see all the makeup there. I'm going to keep going. Crude protein, 15-8, 16-8, 15-8, 16-2. Okay, that's how they work out. Again, we're not looking at crude protein. We're looking at grams of digestible amino acid per mcal of ME and making our assessments that way. That's how we're putting the diets together. Uh, so you can, you know, the crude proteins just kind of float. You can see this, the ADNDFOM, we're in that 32, 31 to 32 range. Minimal starch, you know, on the low starch diet, 17 and a half to 18, 22. So not a big difference in fermentable starch. When you look at the actual starch concentrations, 23 and 28 to 29, right? Uh, ME intake or MEs were about the same, at least formulated. You can see the methionine, 76.8 versus 80, 76 versus 80, 197. You know, so we're going up at least 10 grams on lysine. Dry matter intakes, you know, we went to those high starch diets, the cows ate more. And we're, we're going back to test that. This is all preliminary data. This came out. We were able to put this together uh, the other day. Milk yields, you know, a little bit of a difference there, but not significant. A little bit of a difference there, but not significant. Where we get significance is on the high starch, 105% of the optimum on amino acids. When you do energy corrected milk, now they kind of separate out. We get about a kilo on the low fermentable starch diets by adding more amino acids. Um, when you go to the high fermentable starch and add amino acids and, you know, have higher starch, you see about a kilo, about two kilos of milk difference. Again, we're going back to evaluate everything. This is hot off the press, probably hasn't been fully edited. I know that Andrew's working on making sure he's got all the accurate dry matters. That's probably going to take him a few weeks to settle in. But Brian wanted me to make sure that I showed you this, that you know, we are looking at this. The implication here is that, hey, if you put more starch in there, you get more propionate, you get more signaling, you get a little bit more output if you give them the amino acids. This is kind of like the clamp data, right? Uh, what we don't know here and, and what Andrew and I have been talking about is since they did eat a little bit more, you've actually got greater amino acid production in the rumen. So I'm not sure your efficiencies actually changed if you you know because we were testing the idea of variable efficiency as you increase propionate supply could very well be we just got more bugs and we got better signaling so we got more output and that's what we've got to go back and test but you can see that the cows did respond a little bit when you gave them more starch uh, they actually did use it uh, you can see a little bit in the true protein uh, percentages there body weights they all did what you wanted them to do with body weights Okay, so anyhow, low fermental starch diets had lower dry matter intake, had a little bit more forage, and then beet pulp. So maybe that filled them up a little bit. Had greater true protein yield in the high fermentable starch diets and the MP or the actual the amino acids help with that. Um, where we're at, we got to evaluate everything. So that's kind of a primer. Hold on, you know, fasten your seatbelt. We'll let you know where we go, but. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll have that sorted out. We're just a little bit ahead of it right here. Okay, so just to summarize, how do we optimize efficiency? Got to determine what's most limiting. Do the cows in the model agree? Again, it doesn't matter what piece of software you're using. It doesn't matter. Do they agree? Because if they don't agree, then it's really hard to make an informed decision. In our hands, you know, we're going to look at that room and end balance in urinary nitrogen excretion. If the urinary nitrogen excretion is high and we got plenty of rumen in, we're going to keep pulling out soluble protein sources until we can pull that rumen end down. And while we're doing that, you know, maybe we don't have to pull too much out because you can bring in some fermentable carbohydrate 
use up some of that ruminin, make some more microbes, and then think about bringing in some amino acids. You know, if, if it's just an MP effect, we saw herd a few weeks ago in a case study with fellows where they were deficient in ruminin, but very excess on metabolizable protein, right? So we actually had to go the other way um, on that particular diet. That, I don't see that a lot, but it does happen. Um, once you have those things in balance and you're, you're good with your rumen and balance, now focus on amino acids. For methionine, what we're using uh, as a starting point is 1.15 grams of methane or methionine per mcal of metabolizable energy. And based on those, that study, the first study I showed you from Andrew Lapierre, we put that back through that's a version seven study. We put everything back through 655 to equal the optimum. Under those conditions, we would actually have to feed 1.19 grams of methionine per mcal of ME to equal uh, what we observed in that study of his to get the optimums right. And that's partly that's just a function of in five, 655, we only have bacteria. In seven, we have endogenous protein, we have a protozoa, we have full recycling. It's a completely different uh, calculation. So we, we have to feed a little bit more here to meet that output. The lysine to methionine relationship is 2.7 to one. Again, that's what we generated from our own data. That's identical to Rulquin's number from many years ago now. The way that works, it's pretty straightforward math. The cow's consuming 60 m cows of ME. And it's 60 times 1.19, so that cow to meet her requirements, the real requirements as we understand it, would be about 71 grams of methionine. So people will ask me, why do I think that's so high? Um, I don't, I think maybe we got to, we're getting better at getting to a true requirement. I also wonder about the cysteine, right? We would, if we were a monogastric species, we would be talking about sulfur amino acids and not just methionine. So I'm wondering if we're accounting for a cysteine requirement in that and if it's just some exchange and that's where we ended up. But anyhow, 2.7 times the methionine gets us to 193 grams of lysine. And again, if you're using 6.5, you always want to calculate the methionine first because that's what we derive this relationship on and then calculate your lysine. Don't do it in reverse. Uh, you won't get the right number.